All right, welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon, good morning, um, depending on where you're joining. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm Kim, we're gonna do full introductions in a minute, but I'm part of the Transformers team and I also work as a consultant for GIZ Fabric. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started and move on to introductions. Um, you have a Q&A box, so I encourage you to put your questions in the chat box, or in the, sorry, not in the chat box, in the Q&A box, and um, we will do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and uh, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Alicio. Thank you, Kim, and hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I will jump straight into the presentation. So I think we can go to the next slide, which is where um, I'll be introducing everybody. So um, to introduce the webinar, I guess, and the resource that we're gonna be talking about. Um, the resource was commissioned by the Epic Group, and we've got Vidora from Epic Group here. So Vidora, if you can wave for those, of that don't know Vidora. Um, we also had Norlanka partner on this, so Amila, if you could say a quick wave. Um, Shahi Exports were another partner on the project, and we've got Gori from Shahi Exports here as well, so there's Gori for you. Um, myself, I'm representing Simple Approach as part of the partnership, and um, Kim is with us today, and she is here on behalf of Transformers Foundation and GIZ, who both contributed and supported the partnership. Um, there is also a human rights specialist called Evere, who is not on this call as she's based in the Americas, but she'll be joining the afternoon call, who supported the project as well. Um, the report was written by the Remedy Project, who are a NGO with a legal, with the entire team are legal, um, professionals and they work across civil society law enforcement and private sector looking at the UN guiding principles um, and legal developments in this space. So that's the people behind the report and we can move on to the next slide please Kim. Um, the why? Uh, the resource is intended to enable suppliers who are predominantly based outside of the EU uh, the UK and America, where there is a lot of legislative development at the moment. Um, the report is being um, reflected as a what, first of its kind, you could say, uh, first of its kind because it's a public report, but the difference is that it has been led by suppliers. And traditionally within the space, we see reports which are led by brands, NGOs, think tanks, foundations, but not, um, we haven't really seen any resources which are for suppliers and by suppliers. So I think that's the one of the unique aspects of this report which came out, but it wasn't actually the intention. The intention was to build supplier collaboration and agency within the legislative space. So it's really, the intention of the report was to inform suppliers. We all, all of the partners wanted to better inform ourselves and we saw a gap there that other suppliers also um, need to be better informed on upcoming legislation. Yeah, I think you can go to the next slide. Um, this report, just to mention, will not cover, um, this webinar will not cover the report in detail because it is a very lengthy document, which has ended up at over 100 pages when looking at 12 legislations which are on the screen. Um, however, Gori will join after I finish speaking to go through one of the legislative fact sheets, we're calling them, to show you how it works and how to navigate them. But we will not be going into the nitty gritty detail of the legislations today because it would just uh, take too long. And also, if there are any really technical questions, please do put them in the chat box. If we can't answer them ourselves, Remedy Project are still involved in the um, work and would be happy to also answer them as well. So to let you know why we chose these 12, um, we started by crowdsourcing a list of legislation that may impact apparel supply chains. And we ended up with, thank you to everybody who contributed, 
hopefully some of you are on the call, but we ended up with over 60 different legislative developments that may impact um, apparel suppliers. We had to narrow that down purely based on time and resource, so budget requirements. And we went through a voting process. Um, the suppliers on this call all voted. And we basically looked at um, likelihood of the legislation impacting us if it's not yet passed and the impact we think that legislation will have on our companies. They were kind of the indicators to let us know which we felt were some of the most salient. And we focused on the 12 that we have on the screen here. I think we can go to the next slide, Kim. Um, as I mentioned, we're not gonna go into the detail of each legislation today, but um, we do plan to have more discussion around that going forward as well, but I'm just gonna run through some of the highlights and trends. So some of the things that we pulled out as a group was there is definitely gonna be increased demand for visibility and full supply chain traceability. I think um, many suppliers are already feeling that, but it seems like that is only gonna intensify in the years to come. This is gonna mean increased reporting requirements and data requests. So a lot of the focus that we felt is on reporting and data. Um, this is likely, we feel, to move towards more stringent codes of conduct and contract clauses from brands as they work to protect themselves um, in case of legal investigation and penalties. Uh, brands may interpret and operationalize, and we say may, but it's highly likely that brands are going to interpret and operationalize the new legislation requirements in their own ways. Um, this is very likely to lead to suppliers having to comply with multiple and sometimes conflicting standards, which are responding to um, EU member states, which may also, from what we understand, interpret some of the legislation differently. So what we really felt there is that there is likely to be a huge duplication of work, but in different brand or EU states requirements. So that was a big flag for us and something we want to share with fellow suppliers. Um, there is definitely an increased expectations for the suppliers to implement due diligence processes, which is great, but it wasn't very clear on where the risk responsibility and reward lie within that process. And I think increased focus on grievance mechanisms stood out for us, which again, uh, many of the group felt like may lead to actually, rather than focusing on the impact of a grievance mechanism, it might lead to uh, multiple mechanisms needing to be in place to respond to different brands and legislators. Thank you, Kim, I think we can. So, We've also pulled out a few recommendations for suppliers, again, based on our discussion and reflection of the report findings. And we would recommend that you discuss the implications and implementation plans with your customers. Um, many of us have not done that yet and are looking to do that. And I think that's one of the first, uh, the key takeaways we took from this report is we now feel that we're equipped to have something to talk to our customers about. And it's really important, as I just mentioned, um, to engage brands and retailers before they finalize their methodologies for implementation. Um, as we already mentioned, there is the risk of multiple interpretations along that line. Uh, also, allocate sufficient resource to understanding and proactively complying with the legislation. So currently, those of us on the call that are representing the suppliers all come from the sustainability and ESG teams, but we really think that this legislation is going to have far wider impacts and shouldn't be left um, to the sustainability teams alone. So we would recommend that any suppliers listening today and reading the report look to engage their legal teams, their HR teams, their sourcing teams, and other functions as well, because the legislation is really gonna impact every area of the business. Um, and last but not least is seek out opportunities to engage policymakers to contextualize policy implications and shape their development and delivery. We felt that a lot of the legislation is still vague 
it isn't that clear sometimes whether we are directly within scope or indirectly within scope and what that is going to mean. And that makes it really hard to prepare and comply with it. And we feel that, um, yeah, suppliers engaging in that process would help us all in the outcomes. Thank you, Kim. Um, final side for me, I think, is just touching on a few of the things I've already mentioned, but some of the bigger picture takeaways were that um, we felt much of the legislation is still focusing on a top-down approach to supply chain management. And though well-intentioned, much of the legislation, I think, creates significant hidden work for suppliers who in most cases already disproportionately bear the burden of sustainability in relation to margins. So whilst we feel that the legislation is well-intentioned, we feel that it is um, at risk of perpetuating current supply chain um, or even encouraging supply chain relationships that are um, not as helpful as partnerships could be. So coming back to contractual clauses, et cetera. And I think for those of you on the call that uh, engaged or were working in the industry during COVID, we saw that contractual relationships aren't always the strongest way to protect human rights and the environment. Um, I've mentioned this already, but involve the production experts. Uh, we see a lot of value in implementable and equitable legislation. And as I've said, one of our concerns is that there was a lack of supplier voice within the legislative development. Um, and we feel that involving suppliers could lead to legislation that is better informed, more equitable and more impactful and encourage buy-in from the start rather than trying to catch up as we are doing now. Um, problem shifting was another thing that really stood out for us. We fear that much of the legislation covered in these fact sheets will serve to shift legal responsibility throughout the supply chain rather than sparking meaningful collective action. And I believe that um, I can now hand back over to Kim and Guri, who are going to introduce you to one of the fact sheets within the report. Yes. So let me just get it on the screen and then I'm going to hand over to Guri. But we wanted to show you um, an example fact sheet so that you could, whoops, um, so that you could really, let's see, there we go, so that you could really get a sense of what is what is contained in this document. So on that note, I'll hand over to Gori. Thank you, Kim and Alicia, for setting the context. Uh, like Alicia said in the beginning, we wouldn't have time to go into detail into each fact sheet. So the idea was to just explain the structure because all the 12 fact sheets are structured in the same way. And in fact, each fact sheet is individually downloadable from the Transformers Foundation or other websites where the report is published. So if you wanna just read a single fact sheet or single legislation, you can do that. Uh, but right now I'll just try to explain the structure that has been followed by this group and Remedy Project. So the first section is the overview, which just covers you know, key aspects um, of the of the legislation. Um, and then the second section is the context. And that is more like the political context in which this legislation has come about, what are the objectives of the policy? So that's the section you see uh, on the left, the second section. And then the third section is the status. Um, so, you know, is the legislation in effect already? What stage is it at? Or you know, what is a rough timeline by which it can be expected to come into effect? Uh, like in the case of CS Triple D, which is on the screen, uh, the European Parliament agreed on its position on June 1st. Uh, this report was written slightly before that, so it might not reflect it. So the idea is also to use this report to look at the status, but also remain aware because these developments, the developments are taking place every day. So this is the status of the legislation. Uh, on the day that the draft report was prepared. So we would still encourage you to keep tabs on how the legislations are developing anyway. Next slide. Um, this is an important one. So this is the scope. So that basically means like, how do you 
uh, assess whether you fall in the scope of the legislation. So in this case, there's revenue criteria or you know employee number of employees that you have. Um, so as a supplier, you can see if you're in scope uh, by looking at the criteria mentioned in the fact sheet. And in that case, the next two sections, which I'll tell you about, apply to you. Uh, or uh, if you're not in scope, um, your customers may still be in scope. So then we have a separate section for that, uh, which is section seven. So yeah, I would encourage you to look at this and see, do you fall in scope? Okay, if not, do you have customers that fall in scope? In which case you would have some cascading effects of the legislation. Next slide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So obligations is essentially the duties of the companies that are in scope. So like I said, if you're a supplier, you've looked at the criteria in the previous slide and you do in fact fall in scope of the legislation. So this section covers what your duties are going to be um, as part of this legislation. Yeah. And then the sixth section again is for companies in scope. Uh, let's say you're a supplier that falls in scope. Then this section gives you suggestions to prepare to be compliant with the upcoming legislation. So if it's not been passed or if it's not in effect, then this section guides you on how to sort of start preparing to be compliant. If the legislation is in effect, then this section will maybe just guide you to improve your compliance to be in conformance with the legislation. And one caveat here is that this is not legal advice. Um, this is merely an analysis of the legislation, you know, estimations of potential recommendations. But each company, each individual should talk to their own legal teams or attorneys to get actual legal advice that is custom to you as an organization or an individual. Next section. Um, this is, I guess, the one that's most um, important because um, this is the part that hasn't been discussed uh, as much um, when talking about these legislations. So if you're a supplier that is not in scope, uh, but your customers that are in scope that are, let's say, going to be impacted by CS CSDD, um, then there are going to be you know, potential knockoff effects, potential implications for suppliers. You know, things like demands on traceability, transparency, grievance mechanisms, enhanced due diligence systems, all of that burden shifts to the suppliers. So this section tries to outline those potential effects. But it's important to caveat here as well that a lot of legislations are early stage. So the exact enforcement of the legislation will vary uh, depending on what is the final wording of the legislation you know, on the regulator as well. So again, here it's important to stay apprised as the legislations develop fairly quickly. Um, even yesterday, there was an update on um, the CSRD. So yeah, just staying updated and keeping in mind that this is written at the time when the report was drafted. So things may have shifted since then. Um, section eight is the penalties for non-compliance. Non so if you fall in scope of the legislation, then if you don't comply or if you're failing to sort of meet the requirements, then there are penalties outlined here. Um, just, you know, very important to keep that in mind. And section nine is that if you do not comply, what are the enforcement actions that the relevant authorities can take against you as a company in scope that does not comply or is failing to comply. And that's why section 10 is more around like the reporting and disclosure. So as part of many of these legislations, if you're in scope, you are obligated to disclose key information to the relevant authorities uh, or even in the public forum. So section eight tries to cover that. And section 11 looks at the litigation risk. So if you're in scope as a company and you know it outlines what right is there for legal action to be taken against you if you fail to comply with the legislation. 
Yeah, then uh, the last two are more sort of engagement opportunities. So section 12 looks at if there is, if the legislation is still open for public consultation, then in this case, there isn't uh, any opportunity right now, but there are in a few of them. So this section will tell you what opportunities exist for public consultation, where you can still give feedback and input. And section 13 has additional resources, uh, you know, just elaborating on the legislation or, you know, FAQs or other information that can help you deal with uh, knockoff effects of the legislation or other helpful advice on further complying with or preparing for the legislation. Thank you, Gori. Um, let me go back to the presentation. Um, okay. So we're going to have a little bit of discussion um, amongst the suppliers who were supporting this work, and then we'll also get to the questions in the in the um, uh, questions and answers box. So please, I encourage you to continue putting your questions in there. We'll be coming to them um, and we're gonna have plenty of time for questions. Um, but before we get into the open q and I wanted to just pause and um, ask if Vidura or Amila or Kritika or Alicia, there's anything at this stage that you want to add that you feel hasn't been um, covered so far in the presentation, and then I'll get into some specific questions. I think I should have added at the start. Um, it's at the beginning of the report, but this is not intended to be legal advice. This is intended to inform suppliers of legal developments so that you can learn and seek legal advice if you need to, but should have put that disclaimer at the start. Thanks, Kim. Anybody else have anything that they want to add to the presentation or things that they haven't been covered? No, I think that's good. This is a good um, overview of what we've done. So, okay. Thank you, Alicia and Gauri. All right. Well, then maybe um, one of the things that I think, because as Alicia mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this really is sort of a unique um, collaboration between suppliers, and we don't see that very often. And I wondered, um, Vidura, if you would speak, be willing to speak to why Epic Group decided to support this work and to join the project. Um, because I think that one of the one of the hopes of this piece of work is also that we'll start to see more of these kinds of collaborations amongst suppliers. Um, yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, I think um, um, I would just add to what Alicia has mentioned, um, that we as manufacturers have not really been collaborating in, in lots of areas that we can actually effectively do um, that can further um, sustainability agenda from a manufacturing point of view. So I think this is a start. Um, there's a lot of um, opportunities for us to work together that is meaningful. For example, um, even in this space, um, I, what we felt as we were doing this work is that if we had this type of organization organizing before, um, we could have actually used that opportunity to um, actually be a stakeholder when the legislation is emerging. Um, so that we can actually present the manufacturer point of view um, to people who are drafting legislation. Um, this is, um, as you correctly pointed out, is um, definitely going to be uh, only one of the many initiatives that um, some of the manufacturers here and a larger group that we are working with is uh, beginning to uh, focus on. Um, we are doing a few more areas of work, including uh, uh, how do we support decarbonization in many ways. Um, it's, it's just one example of where we think our collaboration should move. Um, if you look at, um, say, for example, um, how the brands work, they actually have various groups that work very well together, whether it's for um, lobbying or whether it's for solution. Um, um, so it's as, you know, identifying solutions and deploying solutions as a collective group. Uh, we've also seen a lot of uh, NGOs who are actually collaborating similarly. 
Um, and I think if we as manufacturers start collaborating also, a lot more opportunities will open for us to be more effective from a sustainability point of view um, in the global stage. And, and these are priorities for our company. Um, so, so when uh, we actually met, um, what started as an online conversation and when a group of us actually physically met and some of these ideas were discussed, um, it was actually not a big decision from uh, my side and uh, my company Epic side to be part of this type of work where we collectively help each other and improve sustainability both at the same time. Thank you, Vidura. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that question? No, and, and there's no no pressure. Okay. Then um, I think something else that is maybe maybe some of the suppliers uh, on this call um, might be curious about is, you know, how easy or difficult was it to get internal support for this project? Because it's one thing, you know, when you've been meeting with people and building a relationship with them, but that doesn't mean that your companies also have those relationships. And I'm curious to hear, was there any reluctance to work with direct competitors? Because some of you are direct competitors. Um, and Amila, I let you answer this question first. And then if anyone else wants to add, you are most welcome. Sure. Uh, thank you, Kim, for the opportunity. So I'll, I'll start uh, with telling you why Nolanka also joined this uh, project to work on this piece of paper. So, so as Nolanka, we are working, we are also a manufacturer as well as a uh, sourcing office, right? So we are working with 20 plus customers in European Union and UK. And also we are working with 35 plus factories in Sri Lanka and also 100 plus other supply chain partners. So it's a huge number of stakeholders. By looking at these legislations, we do understand that all these supply chain partners are directly impacted by these uh, all these legislations. So we de decided to join this project and get an understanding on how this is happening and what are the important legislations for us so the next thing how we will use this paper is this will be important for our stay the audience as well so as no Lanka, how we are going to use this report is now using this report we know what are the most important legislations and how important they are and also what are so for what kind of challenges we should prepare so we will share all these findings with our stakeholders, our supply chain partners, and we will all will work together to make sure that we are fulfilling the requirements of the customers and also we will be reducing the impacts, our impacts on the environment. And uh, the last question, why the competitors get together uh, to work on this kind of a project? So yes, we are competitors in terms of business, but when it comes to environment and sustainability of protecting the planet, so we definitely are not competitors. We have to get, to get together and contribute to reduce our impacts on the environment. So finally, to have a continuous business, we should have a healthy planet first. So we all got together and worked on this kind of uh, a report which will support all these stakeholders internet parties to reduce the reduce their impacts on the environment and also to be prepared for the future challenges and legislations so that's my point of view thank you very much thank you amila does anyone else want to comment on this process of getting internal support for the project and also maybe how you internally or within your company um, have been using this resource and how it's been how and whether it's been useful to your team and then we'll move to the to the um, open q and a but Fedora, alicia gori and there's no pressure i can maybe just add i think uh... A lot of it was already covered. I think on internal buy-in, to be honest, it wasn't that difficult because the topic is such, right? We see so many brand-like platforms, brand collaboration, direct competitors, and in, in many multi-stakeholder platforms. So why can't suppliers do the same? I think the thought process was that ultimately we are bearing a lot of the risk. We are implementing all the sustainability goals. 
and i think internally i think most suppliers are already feeling the pressure from a lot of the upcoming i mean all the legislations that have been passed like the us post labor prevention act uh, has already been passed so we can already see the need to start preparing you know building more stringent due diligence systems implementing different traceability tools multiple grievance channels so i i think everyone internally at least and i know when we spoke to other suppliers here as well everyone felt that this is a common challenge and a challenge we must sort of address together so if, if brands can do it why can't suppliers especially if we're doing most of the round work um and then on uh, uh, you know on using this report internally so i think the process has just started because the report just released um and the way we see it is it, like elicio said it can't be like one department deciding action plans or working on the implications of this report so we will see how to best absorb the findings which teams should be involved in generating internal dialogue or ideation around how to manage these upcoming legislations and then the other part is like which internal and external stakeholders do we need to engage with uh, whether it's you know regional industry bodies ministries um you know um, or even like international policy makers is is that something that suppliers should do or individual suppliers should do so all of these i would say it's created a lot of like uh created a lot of questions and things that we need to unpack um but it definitely requires a lot of work um, as has already been outlined the the number of demands on our time and resources is only going to increase thank you cory um and i don't know just, if any yeah i uh, just briefly I'm, on that um so let me answer the question about internal resources um within our company some of this legislation was well understood and we had certain uh, processes that was put in place uh, to prepare ourselves for that uh, but when um, we discussed with our legal team about the um, number of legislation that's coming all at the same time um they themselves were very um um keen on doing this mapping so that they can understand where to focus how to focus so 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 once we shared that list the the conversation to suppose was very very fast um the second part uh, that i just want to add on the value of this um one important thing is that this is looking at the legislation from a manufacturer's point of view addressing the key pain points and concerns for manufacturers a um, lot of the documents i've seen never addresses it in from a manufacturer's point of view so so the one of the reasons for collaboration um, creating this platform for collaboration for this piece of work and beyond is that um, even if you take issue like decarbonization or human rights the perspective that persists in the industry is very much of a top down brand or ngo driven as opposed to manufacturer um and therefore it's difficult for uh, solutioning from a manufacturing manufacturer point of view and i think that's one value this piece of work and for the collaboration that we are envisaging will add um uh, into um, our field thanks Thank you, Vidura. And um, Alicia, I think you have also something you wanted to add. Yeah, I was just going to add to what uh, everybody has said, really, and um, add to that in the way and say I think that this is a more formalized suppliers supporting each other, but I don't think that that is actually maybe a new thing. From I'm newer to the supply space and manufacturing space than Guri and Vidura, but. I know that um, within my company, we do consult with other suppliers and manufacturers when there is new things happening within the space, but it's maybe that it's not been in a formalized group setting like this. But I don't think that um, suppliers are necessarily out to compete with each other when it comes to these kinds of things. Uh, it's not that we think one supplier Uh, doing worse means more market share for us, but that actually these are really massive challenges for companies, and we're happy to share with each other on how we can move forward. So I think, yeah, to add to that, that I think suppliers 
do communicate maybe more than most people are aware of, um, but not in this kind of formal way that Fedora mentioned in guidance for ourselves and for others to be able to take that internally and start to have um, clearer conversations. Because I think for me, it, I wouldn't have been able to do this work without the group, but it does mean I do have really clear information now to have conversations both internally and with our customers and anybody else that we need to engage. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alicia. We're going to move to the Q&A because there's a lot of questions in the Q&A box. Um, but before we do, I just want to bring your attention on the screen. I have a QR code. Some of the questions have been around whether there's going to be updates, whether there's going to be more of these types of um, fact sheets, because as Alicia mentioned, the, this resource only covers 12 and there's a lot more out there um, that could use a similar piece of work. And um, yes, in principle, we would like to do that, but it's really contingent upon two things. One is resources and having funding available to do it. So the suppliers on this who commissioned this work all contributed financially to supporting this resource, as well as GIZ Fabric and Transformers Foundation. Um, and the other thing is that, um, uh, so we would love to see if you're interested in supporting those, um, you know, future fact sheets or updates to these fact sheets, please um, give us your, let us know by uh, filling in the, um, uh, the link that the QR code takes you to. Um, and the other was, you know, we wanted to make sure that these were useful and that there was demand. Um, and so if you have found these useful and um, have benefited from them, we would also really love it if you filled out the, um, the link in the QR code to let us know about that. And there was also a question in the chat box about whether there would be, you know, work on engaging in the policy space. And um, uh, here too, if you're interested in that, um, please uh, let us know by um, filling out the form that's linked through this QR code because, you know, the suppliers historically have not really been engaging in this space. And this was one of the, I guess you could say, experiments that we were sort of trying to test um, with this project was, is there actually, you know, is there an interest in this? Um, and if there is, how do we how do we support take that uh, in taking that forward? Um, so I'm going to leave this QR code up just for a couple of more minutes, and then I'll, I'll close it out so that you can, I think, see us a little bit better. But in the meantime, I'm going to go to some of the questions. Um, uh, all right. So um, somebody, Alicia, maybe you can answer this question. The difference between penalties for non-compliance uh, and forms of enforcement. Okay. Um, so this will be a general answer because I can't go into the detail on each fact sheet, but I think the penalties for non-compliance are the how you will be penalized. So that might be financial. Financial is probably the most common one we saw. And the form of non-compliance is letting you know how that a company that will be enforced. So whether that's through the government, whether it's um, civil liabilities, for instance, can citizens, people within the supply chain make a legal complaint against the company. So I hope that has explained it. The two sections very much go together. But one is probably the what the result of non-compliance will be, whereas the other section um, is how the process of being held um, accountable for non-compliance. Hopefully that answers it. Thank you, Alicia. And actually, I should mention another reason to fill out the survey that's linked to through the QR code is we're exploring doing deep dive uh, webinars on each of these fact sheets with the Remedy Project, who are the legal experts, who would be the best people to answer these kinds of questions. But here again, we want to make sure there's demand and interest. So if you're interested in that, again, um, let us know by by going to the to the link on this on the screen. Um, I have a question here. Maybe this is for um, Vidura or, or Gori, but let me know if anyone else wants to answer. We have a question from Max Easton about how can we raise up the leading factories and suppliers who are most uh, environmentally advanced so they can get credit and potentially new sales as a result? 
uh, honestly, I don't have an answer for this. Um, I, I don't think we are the, the, the way the supply chain, the, the business model in this industry is designed for this. Um, this is something that I've been trying to do for the last 16 years um, in this sector as a sustainability specialist. Um, we, we don't have a way that um, that sort of contribution is effectively recognized in a way that is transferred into sales. So I, I don't have anything possible. You know, I, I, there's nothing that I can say that um, um, fits that question. That's OK. Um, anybody else have anything that they want to, to say on that question? Okay. Um, One thing I might add, Kim, is, is to um, ask a question which is much more fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there are two, two issues that are related to this. One is, as a business, how do you want to run a business? Um, if you look at the climate emergency that we are seeing, seeing now, is it enough? If we do this, if it's only tied to sales, is a question that we as manufacturers must answer ourselves. Um, the way um, I can answer from Epic on how we are looking at this business might be illustrative. Um, we there are two drivers for our work because we see some of the urgencies of action both in social and environmental space. The second is that we this is how we see our brand proposition is. Um, so doing some of this work to put us maybe in the leading space or doing something that is very critical to mitigating our emissions, improving the condition of work for people is our brand and who we are. Um, and there is a linkage between that and our market positioning with our customers but I, I can't boil it down to individual sales. So, so I would look at it as a company in a much more broader framework. And we believe that value, holistic value that we bring to uh, the table is the reason of some of our strong customer relationships. Thank you, Vidura. Uh, we have a question from Matthew Gunther. Of the legislation analyzed, how many have direct legal implications for non-EU, UK, or USA organizations without operations in these countries. Um, Alicia, do you want to uh, take a stab at that one? <laughs> I can, and it's not going to be a very satisfying answer, I don't think, but I think it, it really depends on your unique supply chain, um, the scale of orders. So some of the legislation says it's dependent on your turnover within the EU. Some of it says um, we looked at the Fashion Act in New York, and they potentially will look at how much revenue you make within New York. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that for you. But hopefully the fact sheets can at least give you an indication and maybe help you. I think the fact sheets are not meant to be the end of your research, but to help you narrow down your research. So you can start to see, okay, I'm definitely not within scope in this one, but actually I might be within this one. Let me consult with my legal team and look at this in more detail. But um, unfortunately, they all have different angles on which they decide their scope. And it will really depend. I think the uh, four of us suppliers on this call potentially will have different ones which apply to us and not depending on our legal structures um, and our turnover within different jurisdictions. So I will leave it there. I can add a little bit. I think some of the legislations like CS Triple D, CSRD, even in the fact sheets, you'll see the scope is like issues that are defined by revenue or where your operations are based. But some of them, like the forced labor regulations and the uh, uh, ESPR, um, eco design feels like because they're more product related regulations. So then any product going into these markets is subject to those legislations, which means pretty much directly as a supplier or manufacturer, you will fall in scope. That's, I mean, again, that, that's something we have put down in the, in the fact sheets, uh, but the extent to which you're in scope 
etc is again to be discussed with the customers and legal teams and actually this is a related question i think but there's a question about you know we see this is from mahendra tana and she said or and they this person said we see legislation differentiate companies in turnovers and other criteria however suppliers all over the world differentiate between small, some of them have small customers and some of them have big customers. Will suppliers who are small and supply to small brands fall within scope or will they, will they be affected and impacted by this legislation? Does anyone wanna speak to that? I can, or Gori, do you wanna add that? No, no, go ahead. Okay, um, I think it's the same answer. It will depend on when we say small, uh, what size you are. So. The CS D, for instance, they have clear turnover thresholds, um, but other ones, as Gary said, are product specific. So with the um, plastic tax, the UK plastic tax, that is dependent on the content of your plastic packaging. And from what I remember, without having studied that one recently, that is um, that applies no matter the size of the imports. Uh, so again, not a satisfying answer, but this is why we've commissioned the report because we want to be able to go dive into these details. So I hope that you do take the time to go through the fact sheets and um, get in touch with us if you think there is space to do further research and have further conversation around it. Also, I will add a point here that it wasn't always clear. So um, we had, quite an interesting discussion with the remedy project about the vagueness because we kept coming back and saying we still don't understand if we're within scope or not and the remedy project said that's because it's not clear we can't we can't give you what the legislation hasn't provided so we have tried to be open and note that where it's still unclear so that it doesn't feel like we've just forgotten to mention something but that we were not able to decipher that ourselves Thanks, Kim. Yeah, and I think like, I think to a, an earlier point, one of the recommendations we had was to look at ways that you could get involved um, because uh, one of the things that was very apparent to us as we were reading these legislations is that in many cases, it seemed like suppliers hadn't really been included in the legislative process. And what that meant was that people really without knowledge of how an apparel production facility works were sort of um, well-intentioned, but but sort of designing, designing let's say, uh, rules that maybe ha had they understood a little bit better some of the operational realities, they might have approached it a little bit differently. And so I think, you know, this, this concept of inclusion is not just about, you know, you know, from an ethical point of view, but also just from an impact point of view, that if we want to create legislation that is going to have the impact that we all want and that we all, you know, really desire, then we need to sort of uh, take that collectively. There's a question from Amel Ben Zakur about how the legislation will ensure a fair and proportional sharing of the burden of sustainability. Does anyone want to take that one? Or would you like me to take it? <laughs> Why don't you sure. start, Kim, and we led? Okay. I think, um, you know, this is one of the, the, this is something that we really noted in our executive summary, um, is that um, one of the things that we anticipate as a, as a potential consequence of some of these um, proposed or recently passed legislative developments is that brands and retailers will probably look to protect themselves legally um, and that they, there is a risk that they will do that by creating um, very stringent contracts for the suppliers that sort of push legal responsibility onto the suppliers. So when Gori was going through the fact sheets, you know, she's talking about, are you, you know, she she showed you the sections about are you in scope, are you are you not in scope, and I think this was one of the things that um, uh, came out of 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 doing this report is that even if you're not in scope, there's a risk that you could still be legally liable through contracts um, that brands and retailers might put in place to protect themselves, and so. 
Um, and that is actually one of our, you know, one of uh, my concerns is that um, it may not ensure a fair and proportional sharing of the burden of, of sustainability. And that's all the more reason, I think, why suppliers need to work collectively to be involved in this space. Um, anybody have anything to add? I can add a little bit and then we'll hand over to Vidura. I think we all have something to add on this one. Um, but I would say that it, it was, I think, disappointing to see that the legislation kind of skipped over that really important question that we're all asking um, and just focused on the outcomes, which leaves a lot of space and a lot of panic. Um, you know, brands, legal teams are going to have to this. What I'm trying to say is the legislation, I think, is encouraging this contractual approach. And I don't think it's necessarily intended to, but I think it was ill-informed and didn't explicitly address the burden and responsibility and share of that. So for any legislators listening or people working in that space, my ask would be please please consider the wording you use and whether that can turn into an, a contractual obligation or a partnership to improve social and environmental impacts um, and unfortunately post-covid I thought that the industry had seen some of the negative impacts of contracts on people's lives garment workers lives but I think that a lot of the legislation is maybe um, unintentionally or intentionally applying, um, encouraging this contractual top-down supply chain management, which is, I don't think, uh, necessarily going to support the outcomes that we all collectively actually want to meet. And I will stop there and let others add. Vidura, I'll hand over to you. Sure. Um, I think uh, for collective sharing of burden, what is important is that to be an intent in the design phase of a legislation. Um, and looking at the way the legislation has come out, I, I cannot see that happening. So this is one area. Um, and I think the lack of coordinated or otherwise manufacturer voice in the stakeholder process of uh, the legislation um, formation process is also one of the reasons why um, suppliers kind of is invisible within the process. And, and this, this is something that we continuously see. Um, uh, some of the legislation that we had and where we engaged with um, um, certain people who are drafting the legislation, um, we were able to indicate how we might look at a different model um, where the burden is um, shared. So, so we were able to articulate in, in, in few instances that if we had the opportunity to be involved in drafting, how we would draft this so that there is shared, shared responsibility for the outcome, um, uh, which is in a way um, kind of difficult to legislate because legislation cannot um, do a huge amount of work to transform the fundamental business relationships between different entities. Um, but we were able to point out uh, innovative solutions, which will address some of the questions that we are talking about in a, in a shared way. Um, so um, uh, just to echo what Elisio is saying, is that this should be at one level intent in the drafting space, because if that is the case, then there is a possibility of finding solutions that share the responsibility. Um, second is uh, manufacturers presenting their own voice to the critical um, individuals and organizations who are drafting is also important to keep that perspective um, in, in place. Um, third is there's always a lot of solutions that um, a shared approach can get to. Um, it would be nice to see more of them in the upcoming legislation than what we see now. Thank you, Vidura. Um, I have a, there's a question from Kate Jolly, and I, I wonder if this sort of in part stems from one of the recommendations that Alicia mentioned at the beginning of this session was that we really encourage suppliers to proactively work with their customers to um, look at how they intend to interpret some of this legislation to avoid a duplication of standards um, on the supplier side. 
Um, and the question from Kate Jolly is, how do suppliers think brands should ask for the data required for the legislation? Do you find a solution? Do you have any idea of how to do this effectively? Who wants to take that one? Um, oh, Alicia, go ahead. I feel like I'm speaking too much, so I'd prefer if somebody else wanted to take it, but otherwise I can um, I can try and respond. Can you repeat the question, Kim? Yeah, it's about how do suppliers think that brands should ask for the data required for the legislation? Um, you know, what would be a way to ask for data maybe in a way that doesn't require a lot of duplication of work? Or do you have any suggestions or ideas on how to do this more effectively, you know, from the perspective of a supplier? Yeah, so I think actually I'm going to hand over to Vidura there because I think he's done a lot more thinking on harmonized reporting. So I'm going to push it over to you, Vidura. But I do think that, um, yeah. Thank you. Reporting, looking at ways that we can collect the data once and not having to report it in multiple ways will reduce the burden for suppliers. But I will pass over to Vidura, who speaks a lot on this topic. Um, sure. Um, I think we need common platforms. Um, I, I know this sounds very easy. Um, we have been fairly successful in the environmental well somewhat successful in the environmental space using tools like EKVM to collect consolidated data. Um, but we have, even though we've tried maybe about 30 years through five very distinct um, phases, uh, being able to unify data and um, reporting on social space in a unified platform. So um, the past track record is, is not very good in this space, I can honestly say. Um, and I, uh, my fear is that we don't see collective conversation on how to do this, not among brands, not among ma manufacturers, not between brands and manufacturers. Um, so what would be really nice to see is uh, people getting together and talking about this in terms of how to unify the reporting mechanisms. Um, because if we don't do that, and, and the likely scenario is that we will not do this, is that we will have to do multiple reporting on the same issue with different formats, different platforms, different data portals, um, and even what data is captured and how will differ across these standards. So um, this is really looking like Wild Wild West, um, and I just wish it wasn't, but, but I don't have anything good to say. Um, and one of the reasons we did this report is to showcase this and, and hopefully, um, uh, one of the messages that we are saying is that how this will really um, create significant data burdens for manufacturers um, because of different implementation mechanisms. Um, and our hope is that this may kickstart a conversation among different stakeholders in this industry to start thinking about how to get um, unified platforms and mechanisms to get the data. Thank you, Vidura. Um, we are uh, formally out of time in just a couple of minutes, but we are able, for those of you who are interested in staying on, we can stay on for a little bit um, for an extra five to 10 minutes or so to get through more questions. Um, but if you do need to uh, log off, um, thank you for joining. Uh, we're really grateful for your support. And there's a lot of questions in the chat box about um, uh, you know, how to update this piece of work, how to keep it going. And again, um, I encourage you to um, I'm going to share my screen again. I encourage you to 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 go to the link in this QR code to um, to to indicate your interest in this because um, really the main barrier to keeping this work going is uh, we want to make sure that we have a lot of supplier support for it and we need to have resourcing for it. Um, so. Um, but for those of you who would like to stay on, we still have a lot of questions, so we'll see if we can uh, we can get through them. Um, I have one um, 
fairly uh, simple question, I think, um, from Hamza uh, Elahi about what's the impact on yarn manufacturers who are a few stages removed from the direct um, suppliers to the brands and retailers? Is the whole value chain affected? Um, does anyone want to take that one? Okay, I, I can answer that one briefly. Um, the short answer is potentially yes, um, because it, but it really will depend um, in the sense that, um, you know, a brand and even if the direct supplier to the brand and retailer is not in scope, they are going to, they're likely to experience knock on effects um, because the brands and retailers will come with the, to the, to their direct suppliers with requests and the direct suppliers in order to be able to fulfill those requests, whether it's for information or grievance mechanism or whatever it might be, traceability, um, will need stuff from their suppliers. So the whole value chain is going to be impacted uh, by this. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think Amila was going to add something. Amila, did you want to? Please. Add yes. Please. So yes, I can at some point. So if if I take an example, so if you take, uh, so it's not uh, almost relevant to these legislations, but if you consider or if you say that uh, one customer needs to need to expose their scope three emissions as well then the whole supply chain will be impacted so uh, same as that if the customers or are like want to express their or expose their whole supply chain and uh, show the impacts on the environment like carbon footprint or something so the whole all the sectors will be impacted and all the uh, supply chain partners will have to share their information or the data with the customers and then only this will be successful and it will be important as well yeah thank you can we can't hear you yet oh sorry thank you um, there's another question from, oh, it just jumped on my screen, um, from, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, so I apologize, from Chandra Kumar. Um, and the question is about the role of legislation in the countries where production is happening. Um, and the question is to drive these types of legislation, it's important that they're incorporated at national government level across the countries where production is happening. What kind of initiative are we taking to include the apparel, textile bodies and associations of respective countries to drive this um, to the broader industry level? Um, and uh, quickly, what I'll say on this is GI, GIZ Fabric, which is one of the supporters of this initiative, uh, is very closely affiliated with the STAR Network, which is a regional association of textile manufacturer associations. Um, and so we're hoping to be able to, to that, they will, that there will be some collaboration there, but there's no concrete plans um, at the moment. Any other, sure. anyone else want to answer? Sure. Um, hi, CK. Uh, uh, this... Um... We've actually engaged with um, JAF, for example, in Sri Lanka, and we are also engaging with BGMEA. So we want to reach out to all the industry associations uh, directly or through the STAR network through that, uh, because I think uh, taking the, this into local facilities um, is something that those industry bodies can do much more effectively than us. Um, and we are hoping that they will come back to us and, and we can create that collaboration that can give feedback back into the legislation drafting organizations uh, that they may also, after looking at this, understand that that's a space that they need to be actively engaged with. Thank you. And Eunice, I, I see you, Eunice Chan, I see you have a question similar uh, of a similar nature. So hopefully what's just been shared answers your question as well. Um, Fedora, there was a question on the US political uh, landscape that uh, from uh, uh, Vin, it says the Republicans in the US have just proposed bills to um, uh, are bills against ESG to the, due to their fear of their uh, financial industry collapse. What do you think? I know this was a question you were keen to take on. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, two points. Um, I don't know whether it's accurate to say that ESG is actually going to lead to financial industry collapse. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I understand some people are saying it, um, but 
perhaps not addressing climate change will create huge financial disruptions um, in the US even as we see now. Um, I think what's important is that um, uh, if you take something like New York Fashion Act, um, the way, uh, if you read the, uh, the, the document that we did, the way it impacts a lot of um, apparel brands who are selling in um, US will force them to um, have to adhere to the requirements in the legislation. So even if a lot of states in US um, do different things, um, some large states like New York or California taking up uh, specific legislation on this space will impact all almost all the main brands in US. So, so I think that would be the answer. Uh, if the US New York Fashion Act comes, 90% of the brands who are selling in US will have to comply to that requirement. Kim, you're on mute. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I said thank you, Vidura. Does anybody want else want to add anything to that question or? No? Um, there's a very simple question uh, from uh, Noshad Zia Siddiqui. Again, I apologize for the mispronunciation. Um, when would the legislations come into effect? I'll just answer this one briefly. It depends on the legislation. Um, and uh, we encourage you to look at the fact sheets because in the status section of each fact sheet, there's information about this um, and where in the legislative development process it is. Again, that's as of the time of the report being written. Um, so um, it will need to be updated and we hope that there will be enough interest and support to be able to do that. Um, there was another question, um, um, uh, there's a question about, uh, vendors. How do we get suppliers actively engaged in the facilitation in this discussion with customers, which we're recommending, uh, without having, uh, the vendors sort of, um, uh, driving and I, I'm not sure, but I, I think this is again a question from Chandra Kumar, but I, I think the question is about um, how to sort of involve age, um, vendors or agents um, in the process. Does anybody want to speak to that? I just wanted to check if Kritika, you want to talk about the YES project and how we are trying to engage our suppliers and due diligence. That could be one example. Yeah, I can take that on. So uh, because the U.S. Uh, Xinjiang Forced Labor Act and the upcoming EU Forced Labor Product Law, both of these are sort of coming, uh, asking us to uh, remove forced labor cotton from our supply chain. We uh, started the YES project, which is um, yarn ethically and sustainably sourced. So with that project, we have to go to our vendors and talk to them, help them understand what is forced labor, uh, run them through trainings and sessions. And Sorry, sorry, my net. Yeah, we have to make them go through trainings where we elaborate what information we want to gather and how can that information help us and them comply to these standards, uh, these legislations that US and EU. Sorry, I'm just having a bad cold. Uh, that these, uh, how can we comply to these legislations? So um, the journey to that actually is a very uh, gradual journey where. Uh, we first start with, uh, as I said, capacity building, and then we give them a year's time or two years time to uh, talk about, <laughs> to uh, share information. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Don't worry, Kritika. <laughs> Thank you for being here despite being unwell. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So um, yeah, I would, I would just complete that. Uh, it is a gradual journey where we, uh, we hold their hand and we let them know that this is the information we need. It's a three-year plan where we engage in the first year, we give them information that this is what we will need. In the second year, we will uh, make them interact with traceability platforms that Mr. Vidura was talking about. And in the third year, we will reflect on the information that they have given and support them. So it's never a disengagement strategy where one year we ask them for information and we stop sourcing from them. So it's gonna be a very collaborative approach with our vendors. That's what we are taking with the yes approach because we want to have all the forced labor out of our supply chain. So that's how the collaborative three-year plan will work. 
Thank you, Kritika. And um, I'm just going to ask the panelists because we're we're really out of time here. Um, but are there any questions in the in the Q and A box that you'd really like to answer that you haven't had a chance to answer? Okay, uh, I think there were two questions. I think that uh, um, perhaps you can answer as well. Um, there was one question um, that uh, Chandra Mohan has asked. Is there a way that they can be part of this type of collaboration? Um, then there is the question um, that's just after that from Mr. R Dr. Rajesh Baida about um, uh, how we can engage as a stakeholder. And there's a third question. I, I think these three are um, um, how this work moves forward, which is from Saurabh Kumar. Um, how how does this piece of work update and how do we continuously engage? So if you can answer to those three, I think that will be very good for everyone. Okay, thank you. Sure. So I'm going to share my screen again, um, because as we said at the outset of this um, presentation, this collaboration really was an experiment. Um, you know, the suppliers who were commissioning and leading this work, um, and hopefully it's okay if I speak on your behalf here for a moment, but um, I think like it was kind of an, it was a test, you know, we, they, you, we wanted this resource to be publicly available so that other suppliers could benefit from it, but we didn't know, would anybody find it useful? Would anybody else want to read it? I mean, we thought and we hoped that people would, uh, but we weren't sure. Uh, and so, you know, again, I've, I've put this QR code up on the screen and we're hoping that if there's a lot of interest and support for this work um, and we have enough um, interest, especially from the supplier side, that we can do updates to these fact sheets and that we can also look at potentially engaging um, in the policy space uh, in, a, in, a, in a collective way. Um, and so we're sort of in the very early stages of figuring out what that might look like and how we might do it. Um, but the first step really is um, knowing whether people are interested in that. So I really encourage you to go to the link that's on, um, in this QR code um, and to express your interest, um, because that's really the first step to being able to do updates, to being able to, to talk, have discussions about how we engage collectively in the policy space um, and um, and uh, and also in to, to to getting the resources that we would need to be able uh, to do that. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to add to to that? I just add. I think for anyone, if this QR code isn't working, um, there are email addresses available as well, which we can. Um, I think they're in the report. Are they Kim, or maybe we can? It's linked. They're they're linked in the report. Yeah, there are email versions too. So. If you're trying to get in touch and the QR code isn't working, there are email addresses in the report. So please um, do reach out. Um, any other last burning questions that anybody would really like to answer before we close this session? And I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to all of them, um, but we will uh, do our best to also come back to you privately uh, if we didn't get to your question. But Gori, Amila, Kritika. I oh, just want to thank everyone for staying back uh, and engaging so much. Usually in the webinars, there's like one way dialogue, but it's <laughs> really nice to see that everyone was engaged. And even though we weren't maybe able to like answer all questions, I think we're also leaving as a group with a lot of ideas to, on what to do next. All right, uh, I would echo Gori's thank you. Thank you for spending your a piece of your day with us. And um, uh, any any last words from anyone else? No. Then on that note, um, I uh, thank you again for coming. And hopefully, we this is the first uh, and the beginning and not the end of this conversation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.